All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us tonight for another session of Deep Dive training with the Government Contractors Association. If you're joining us online, welcome. If you're joining us here in the classroom, it's good to have everybody here. Uh, this is Deep Dive is a time for the members of the association where you can come and we take you through a series of training in the government market. And it's a six month cycle. And so this is the last session of the series. And next week we'll do another review session. And so tonight I want to talk about uh, these three key items. Uh, really the 12 steps to winning government contracts and then the three perspectives. And so that's, that's how I'm gonna do the review tonight. But before we do that, I wanna talk about something that is like all of you as business owners should know. What do you guys think I'm gonna talk about? Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yes. So what happened today? This is a historic day. Bitcoin hit $10,000 today. Anybody owns Bitcoin in here? Anybody? Just two people. Oh. Okay. Huh? The first time I bought Bitcoin, it was seven hundred dollars. And uh, but I know people who pay, you know, ten bucks for it, twelve bucks actually. So so I have a I have one of our friend. She. Uh, this is like about four and a half years ago. Her son came to her and said, Mom, you believe in me, right? She said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I want you to invest in me. And she said, yeah, I'm investing in you. And he, she said, you know, so how much you need? He said, I need $1,000. She said, well, that's a lot of money. What do you need $1,000 for? He said, I'm going to go invest in something, but just think about it. you're investing in me. You're not investing in that. You're investing in me. And she said, okay, I'll invest in you, $1,000. And so then he said, I'm going to go invest in Bitcoins. Because at that time, no one, you know, Bitcoin, you know, who cares, right? So, so they took, he took $1,000 and bought Bitcoins. And 500 he said, I'm going to buy for his mom. And 500 he bought for himself. So she didn't know. But then he came back and he said, Mom, I, I took the money. I invested in some for you and some for me. And one day I think it's going to be worth a lot of money. So that's what he told her. Well, she came up to a training session with us. And just like I'm talking to you about Bitcoins right now, I'm, I'm telling the room about Bitcoins, which is, you know, the reason I'm talking about Bitcoin is in the near future, your business is going to be receiving money in Bitcoins. In addition to green cash, in addition to credit cards, in addition to checks, you will be receiving payments into your company for selling your products and services by Bitcoins. That's how you're going to get paid. So, so I'm telling everybody this here, and she said, wow, my son said he got me some Bitcoins. I wonder what it's going for. So she has 71 Bitcoins. That's $710,000 for $500 investment. So from the $1,000 investment, they've got over one, almost $1.4 million from a $1,000 investment a few years ago. How, how, how liquid are they? Very liquid. You can convert it to cash. In fact, now they have a credit card. And so, not a credit card, but they have a, a debit card. And so, it's, it's just a Visa card. And so, if you, you keep your coin on your digital wallet, but then when you go and spend it, like at Target or anywhere else, you can go to Restaurants or anything, you just swipe a card, just like a Visa card, and it, it doesn't it does convert. It just sends it to the to the merchant in U.S. dollar. Oh, okay. But you keep it in digital, and you want to keep it in digital because it keeps going up in value. Whereas fiat currency, what it, what happens every year? It loses value about one to two and a half percent every year because of inflation, right? 
It's about two to three percent inflation rate every year. Bitcoins, there's only how many Bitcoins right now? 16 million Bitcoins. In terms of the total supply, there's, there will only be a total of 21 million Bitcoins. So this is a very, very, um, so it, it hit a very uh, important milestone today. So that's what I'm talking about it. All right, so coming back to government contracting. So I, I gave you guys a handout, and I want to talk about the 12 steps to win a government contract. So tonight, I want us to do a little bit of a game. And so for those of you who join us online, um, let me see if I can put you guys on speaker. All right, so I, I can, I've got you guys on speaker. And I've got Gerald. Gerald, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. You hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Good. Linda, can you hear us? I do, Abraham. Thank you. Okay. All right, so tonight I'm going to do a little bit of training, and we're going to train from this sheet here. We're going to start with this here. So we're going to be training. Oh, I don't know what's not showing. Okay. So we're going to be training from this document. So who already knows all twelve steps without looking at the sheet or the the screen? Anybody? <laughs> All right, so 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 tonight, I mean, because this is the bedrock of all of our trainings, so I want to kind of play a little bit of game, and the winner of this here, guess what they get? A Bitcoin. Not a Bitcoin. <laughs> they get a fractional Bitcoin. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give the winner a fractional Bitcoin. So pay attention. So don't fall asleep on me. Pay attention because you can earn some bitcoins. Look at it. Do you have your wallet? Did you pull it up? Yeah, pull it up. Pull up a jack. It's triple in value, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So since I've given it to you. Yeah. Right. Do you see it? Yeah. right. Yeah, I think I gave you ten dollars back then, or was it five or something? Yeah, it should be worth. Uh, should be worth about thirty bucks now. Maybe even more. <laughs> I need to stop giving it away. <laughs> Well, I'm a, I, you know, I, I'm an ambassador, right? So I'm an ambassador for it, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm ambassador of goodwill for Bitcoin. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We've got two, four, six, seven, eight people, and so I want one person to represent one letter. Got it? So we'll start right here. You are A, you are S, you are E, you are R, you are I, you are M, and then Gerald, you are uh, R, and then Linda, you are O. You guys got that? And then coming back here, you are, you get to, go, some, some of you get two letters, okay? So you're O, you're the first P, you're the second P, you're the third P, no, the, the first C and the second C. 
So ASRM Rob CC. That is the acronym of our 12-step methodology in terms of how to go win government contracts. So everybody say with me, ASRM. ASRM. Rob CC. Rob CC. A S E R I M R O P P C C. ASRM Rob CC. So her name is Asrin Rob CC. Asrin is her first name. Rob CC is her last name. So you are, since you are A, I want you to remember that A stands for assessment. And I want you to remember S stands for strategy. And I want you to remember E stands for education. And then R stands for registration. So you, most of you only have to remember one letter. Four, five of you have to remember two letters and what they stand for. And then as we do this, sir, I'm going to define what each letter and what, what each words really mean. And then as I go through this process, we're going to learn a step at a time. And then at the end, you're going to have to say A is assessment and what it means. What does assessment mean as it relates to the context of what we're talking about? I right, said, so we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and start, and we'll start here. And so when it's your turn, you say your letter. All right, we'll go ahead and start here. A. A, that's it. That's all you need to say, just a letter. Next. Yes. Okay, next. E. You got it? You got it down, right? E, right? Okay, next. E. R. R. I. I. M. All right. Gerald. R. Okay. Linda. O. And coming back around. P. P. I thought it was C. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so that's. Those are the letters. So let's go. Let's go faster this time. Okay. So this time I'm not going to point at you. We're going to start, and then everybody just kind of go in a circle. All right. So go ahead and get started. A S D R I M R O P P C C. All right. All right. So so let's let's go a little bit cleaner this time. That that was a good practice. Right, so let's do it for real. Let's go and say it in, in a fast, nice flow here. So let's start again. A-S-D-R-I-M-R-O-P-C-C. Okay. <laughs> You're going again. All right, so, so that's good. So Asterim, Rob, C-C. So now that we've gone through the letters, let's go through the words, okay? So this time, when it's your turn, don't say the letter, but say the word. So when it's your turn, say the word. Assessment. Strategy. Education. Registration. Marketing. Relationship. Opportunities. Proposal. Performance. Compliance. Loader. Okay. All right, so that's, that's good. Let's do it one more time. Let's start again. Strategy, education, registration, marketing, relationship, opportunities, proposal, performance, clients, loader. All right, that's good. I said, now I'm going to go and describe and explain to you what these things mean. And then uh, up next, what I'm going to do is. Up next, I'm, what I want to do is I want to uh, uh, I want you guys to remember what each letter means. At least the person who's responsible for that one word. Okay. So A stands for assessment, and this is where you figure out where you are and if the government is right for you. The government market is right for you, and then so that's assessment. Where you are. Is, the, is, is your product and your services right in the government market? Because not every single product is a good fit in the government market. For example, what might be a, a product or service that's not a good fit in the government market? Any, any examples anybody can think of? Mortuary? Yeah, probably not a good fit, you, you know. 
or mortuary, not, probably not the best fit. Now, they do need that every now and then, but you're not going to make a lot of money. What else? What about pole dancing? Any any pole dancers in the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they don't buy it on the record, okay? <laughs> the CIA have been known to buy that, but they, they don't buy it on the record. No, they do buy that on, in the commissary. Yeah. So, what about hairstylists or barbers, right? Don't they use barbers when they got They do, but there's not. It's not a good business. If you're if you're a barber shop, you're not gonna make a lot of money in the government market. Yeah, they just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the salons? Like the women, they want their hair done. There's salons, you know, I, I don't know, there may be salons in the military base, maybe, but I think they, they, they just use the commercial services. Yeah. So there's a few little industry like that. Oh, for example, if you sell health insurance, right, individual health insurance. Now, if you sell AFLAC, there may be a market to work with city government and because, you know, that's, that's supplemental insurance. But if you sell traditional insurance, the government works directly with with the big insurance providers, so they're not going to probably not allow opportunities if you sell health insurance. So there's a few little niches. I would say less than one percent in terms of all the industries, all the products out there, which is not a good fit in the government market. But overall, everything is a good fit. But first, you have to do an assessment. So explain to us what I just say in your own words. What what is assessment? I'm just thinking about. It. Okay, good, good. All right, so let's move on to S, which is strategy. Strategy has to do with having a game plan and determining two key things. What is a short-term strategy and what is a long-term strategy in the government market? The long-term has to do with how to build a sustainable company long-term beyond being a small business. The short-term has to do with what's the quickest way to money the fastest way. So that, that's strategy from my perspective as it relates to government contracting. Now let's talk about some examples of some short-term strategy. Getting certified as a woman-owned business, that's a short-term strategy. Getting your 8A certification, that's a short-term strategy. Getting any certifications at all, those are short-term strategies. Being a subcontractor in the government market, that's a short-term strategy. Being a prime can be a short or long term strategy. Growing beyond being a small company or using your, your 8A certification is good for how many years? Nine, nine years. Yeah. It's good for nine years. What do you do after nine years? If, if you only have a short term strategy after you graduate or your 8A, what do you do, right? Most companies, they die. And I can show you examples of companies that grow through 8A and then after they graduate the 8A, they lose their business and they're no longer operating in the government space because they don't have a long-term plan, huh? That's why I just had three, uh, couple billion employees and they're getting certified from other steps in the first about this five. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that, so that, that's a good point. So as an 8A company, there's a few ways, because that's part of your strategy, right? What happens, what do you do once you graduate out of your 8A? What are your strategies? So the one strategy is the first thing you can do as an 8A graduate, you can buy another 8A company. So if you buy another 8A company, someone who's brand new in the government space, who don't understand the game, who's never won a contract, and they, they've got the, they got their 8A certification, they need, um, they need someone to help show them the ropes. And so, and so when, when, it, when you get approached by a graduating 8A company or soon to graduate 8A company, they're trying to extend their life of their 8A because they're, them as an individual and their company is done forever. You can never get into the 8A program again. You can never get into the 8A program again. Your company and yourself. 
So you see, it's, it's over. It's a business development program. Yeah. So, so for those who understand or who do have a long-term strategy, what they do is they buy another 8A company. Because the SBA allows you to buy, I believe, up to 40% of another 8A company. And you can buy another 8A company, let's say they're doing $50,000, $100,000 a year in the commercial market, now they're trying to expand to the government market, you could pick up another company for $10,000, $20,000. Yes. Yes. So now they now they they themselves don't have the 8A, but this new company they bought, they can take the existing contracts that they have under the 8A sole source, and they they can tell the contracting officer say, hey, I have an 8A company. They're you know we're part owners of this 8A company. You love the work that we're doing. Flip the contract to this other company. So that's how they continue. So that's part of a long term strategy. It, which is to to uh, buy another 8A or to be a mentor to a small company. So if you're, let's assume you're growing to 20, 30 million dollars in, in revenue as a small business and you graduate out of the 8A program, then you would become a mentor to another small company and help them groom and help them to grow. So those are some, sh some, some, some good long-term strategy. For a large company, you got to think, you know, you as a small business, you got to think about your legacy and your exit plan, right? So who, who here, your exit plan is to sell your company at some point? Okay, a few of you. Who here is to IPO your company? Nobody? No one's going to IPO? Who here wants to leave their company as a legacy to their kids or to their family? Okay, a few of you. All right, so it doesn't matter what your, what your exit plans are. Uh, if your exit plan is to sell your company, if you're, if you're a government contractor, who do, what do you think a company that's buying your company, what are they most interested in? They're not interested in your 8A because that, that graduates, right? So, and once they buy your company, they, you lose your 8A anyways, or you lose your small business. If a larger company buys a small company, you lose your small business status. So that's not what they're interested in. What are they interested in? If, they're, if a larger company, you're building your company to sell, if a larger company is gonna buy your company, what do you think they're interested in? They don't care about revenue. Our capacity. Your capacity to, to open up more doors for them. Yeah. <laughs> So, so here's what that means. Assuming that there's a, your, your, your company is based here in, in Georgia, and let's assume that you're, you've built a good relationship with Fort Benning, the CDC, uh, with FEMA, with the Federal Reserve Bank here in, in Atlanta. So you, you've, you've built a good relationship with southern agencies, federal agencies and, and local agencies. And the company in California, they're, they're growing big in the West Coast, and they want to expand east. So instead of hiring a, a moving a staff person, opening up a new office here, the quickest way is just coming because you already have relationships, you've got contracts already, you have you know a foothold, you've got relationship going already. It's better for them just to come buy your company in the government market. Sometimes they buy you because you have certain technology, because you have certain patents, certain, but most of the times you're a government contractor. They buy because of the contracts that you have, but more so the relationship that you have that's established in the government market already. That allows them to quickly expand into that market using the relationship that you have, using the personnel that you have, using that. So if, you're, if your goal is to sell, then the most important thing you do is make sure that you build a, a good, strong team that understands government contracting. If you don't have that, it's not going to be very attractive when you're trying to sell. Unless you have certain technology or a unique product that, and you're the only person that have that product. So those are some, some strategies there. All right, so Mr. Cartwright, tell me, summarize what strategies uh, mean. Uh, 
uh, Ronald Turner uh, could be uh, visiting himself uh, for a large company or becoming a large company. Yeah. So to go out and pay a presentation and then punch the gun for another company. So okay. Basically, the strategy is to run for short term. Okay, and short term is is the what? Certain, the certification. Yep, but is is it a short? Is it the faster way to money or longer way to money? Oh, short term, um, when would be the fastest way. Faster way to money. How do I make money? Yeah, how do I make money in two, three, four, five, six months? Because as a small business, you're not thinking how am I making money three years from now. <laughs> you got to think how am I going to make money in a few months. Okay, let's move on to education. So education has to do with learning to speak governance. Speaking this contracting language and the language of government contracting for our purpose now the rest of the world doesn't call it governance But we here at GCA we call it governance And that is a, a GCA ism to where we we coined the term learn to speak governance Which is made up of acronyms jargons Many many of these different uh, different terminologies that only is using the government sector you know whether it's at the state level county level if you speak governance at the federal level and you go to the state level, it's a different dialect, right? There's terminology that's synonymous, but it's a different dialect. Just like Spanish, right? Spanish in Spain is different from Spanish in Mexico. Spanish in Mexico is different from Spanish in Central America. Very different. Slight differences, but you, overall, you know, you understand each other. English in the United States is different from English in Great Britain is different from English in Australia. So learning governance has its different, you know, governance can be a different culture. It could be a different, different words, different terminologies. All that has to do with educating yourself. Now in the real world, if you, if we took, um, we took Gerald, Gerald since you're the youngest person in the room, if we took you and we moved you to China, how long do you think before you can start to speak Mandarin? Probably uh, maybe another 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for the rest of us, how long? Before you can kind of speak it a little bit, because you're, 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 you're there and you're trying to learn. You're not just there as a tourist. You're there, you, you, you got to make business there. You got to go, you establish your business there. You're on a mission to grow your company over there. How long before you speak the, the language? At least conversational. Five, five years. Sixty days for one person? I I promise you English is harder. Really? English is harder. That's five hours. Yeah. Well, it took me six six months to pick up uh, actually Swahili, and uh, Swahili six months, and but in Indonesia it was very different, very different. Yeah. So yeah, in generally six to twelve months is about the time where you can start to acclimate a little. You start to understand enough. Now for me. I've, I've been in the government space for 10 years. It took me about three months full time, fully immersed in this culture to kind of to start to speak it in broken governance. And for most of you, you're not doing it full time, you're doing it part time. Because you're doing your main thing, some of you are working full time and you're trying to build your business on the side. It's going to take you six to 12 months before you can slowly start to speak governance. But it's all about how you apply yourself, right? Now, my parents have been in the United States. We've been here almost 40 years. My, my, my parents can barely have a conversation with all of you because they didn't immerse themselves into the language, into the culture here. They, they got here, and not, not to knock my parents because they got here and they had to go to work to provide for their family. And so they didn't they did go and get an education and then they stay within the, our community, our Hmong community, so they didn't get the opportunity to learn. As such, they don't speak English very well. So it's about how you, just because you're there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to learn, right? So, so all of you are coming to classes. You're coming here so that you can learn Governese. 
if you don't practice, if you don't apply yourself to this here, you can show up every single Tuesday night. You're not going to speak this language. So you have to apply it and practice it. And what's another good way to help you to really speak the language? Read. But get, yeah, get a dictionary. Um, I have a governance dictionary that I'm working on, and at some point I'm going to publish it so that every the whole world can have a governance dictionary. And um, yeah, we've got lots of resources. The best way to speak is to make new friends. Right. I, I agree. Speak the language. Make friends with someone who speaks the language so that you can speak the language and practice and don't like Myra, she's going to Korea. She, we're taking a delegation of companies uh, this weekend to, to South Korea. And Myra's been practicing her, her, her Korean. How, how's it coming, Myra? Uh, not very well, apparently. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so, so you got to practice, you got to immerse yourself. So that's part of education. All right, so, so summarize for me what education means. Um, education this is the process of, of, of learning. Um, learning. You, um, learning, it, learning means you being able to communicate um, in such a way that um, other people uh, can understand you. Exactly. And what do we call it here? Governance. Governance. Learning the language of contracting. All right, so let's go to R. The first R, there's two R. So the first R stands for registration. And registration has to do with registering two main things. Registering to be a vendor and registering as in terms of all the certifications that you need to get. So your women certification, web certification, minority, you know, MBE, WBE, FBE, with the city, county, federal, all of this certification falls under registration. Where does Native American fall? Native American falls under the 8A program and, or as a minority business. Yeah. Now, what percentage Native American are you? Myself. Yeah. 50? You still have your tribal card? Yes, I do. I just got my older card. I just need to return to Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, what tribe are you with? Say it again. Okay, okay. All right, awesome. So are you uh, one of the uh, 100 and what? 110 federally recognized tribes? Okay, awesome. Well, yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys doing the government contracts? Uh, no, we don't. We don't do any government because we actually, yeah. it's really sad because a lot of times we lose a lot of money because we have people come in and they kind of, it, it's really kind of, our politics are not. Everybody's not trained. They don't mm -hmm. have master's degrees. We just have tribal contracts. Mm -hmm. So when people come in and bid on contracts or whatnot, we kind of lose a lot of money because we don't, we don't, we don't realize they don't know what they're doing as far as what we choose them to do. Work yeah. Right well, I'm talking about the opposite of that. Oh, the legal government. No, I, that's what I'm trying to do. We don't have a lot of uh, business people in my tribe or a lot of our members that do a lot of business. So, so just as much as the tribe can own a casino and all the tribe members benefit from that, mm -hmm. in the government market, the tribe can own a company. Absolutely. They call that a super 8A. Mm -hmm. And whereas for the rest of us who are just a regular 8A, mm -hmm. you graduate after nine years uh -huh. and your sole source threshold is $4 million. So would that mean that once I got my 8A, once that 8A ended up in nine years, I could go on to super 8A? No. So, so, so the difference of you as an individual getting your 8A is your, your social threshold is $4 million, meaning that if anything less than $4 million, the government can do a direct award to one company. 
and as a regular 8A company, you graduate after nine years. Whereas a super 8A, you, you never graduate. You cannot. The tribe has to own the company. So it has to be a tribally owned company. They call it a TOC. Yeah, so the council will have to meet and say, hey, why don't we, outside of casinos and outside of all the other ventures that we're doing, why don't we start a government contracting company and get certified as a super 8A and you can go out there and have an 8A status forever, at least right now it's forever. It, the law may change. In fact, there are some people that's trying to change the law because they feel that it's unfair to all the other companies. Um, I believe that you can never make it right for what we've done to, to your ancestors and to the Native Americans. We can never repay that for, for all the travesty that we as a nation, and even though I wasn't alive, I wasn't there, but as a nation, I live in this country, I take full responsibility for everything that we've done in our history. And, and so we could never make it right. So, so, so the Super 8A, the first thing is you can be, you can stay in the 8A program forever. And the second thing is there is no threshold. You can get a hundred million dollar social source contract. So that's only through the tribe. Only through the tribe. Not individual. Not individual. As a tribe, as a nation. As a nation, you will own a country, you will own a company, and then you can go and get a huge contract. Now the some of the largest government contractors are native owned companies, but they're not lower 48 states. They are Alaska native corporations. And if you, if you look at the list of the top 100 companies, about three of them are native American companies, Alaska native American companies. Fifty You have to have your tribal card. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're Native American, even if you're 100 percent Native American, but if, if the tribe doesn't own the company, then it's just a regular 8A company. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just they, it, we call it Super 8A, but it's just an 8A program, but it's tied to the tribally owned company. So and it's, it's interesting to note yeah. that you know actually I've been looking at I want to build a school on my reservation, a vocational school mm -hmm. for our kids, for our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, because they believe that they think because you're Native American and either way, I'm trying to go to school. Yeah. Um, and that's great. Yes, yeah, so, so so if you if you still have connections back to your tribe if you still have connections back to the tribe, and at some point, if they're interested, you know, Myra and myself were more than happy to. Okay, so so talk to the council, and to, to see if there is a interest, and if there's an interest, we can kind of we kind of give you more information. We could do like a conference call to educate the council a little bit more about how this program works, and and this will bring jobs back to the community. And it will benefit all the members of the community. Yeah. So, so each person is like a shareholder, just like just like how casino works. Yep. Yep. It's the same thing. You you guys are all shareholders in the tribally owned company. Yeah. So 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 let me know, and Mara, we can kind of uh, talk more about that. Unfortunately. Only Native Americans that's that's recognized by the by the U.S. government. But, but they, 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 they did very horrible things to the Mexicans here. Yes, absolutely. Horrible. Yes, and they you know, as a nation we have a lot of history of uh, travesty, right? Uh, you know the the Chinese Exclusion Act, the uh, Japanese internment camp. The Italians, they were greatly, you know, there was some great injustice that happened to them in the first few waves where the Italians first came to the U.S. So, so every generation, we oppress somebody. <laughs> that's, our, that's our history. That's, the Mexican has several roles. <laughs> Mexican has been somebody very appealing to be. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so there's been some, some travesties and, and 
that's that it's a shame as humanity that sometimes we don't necessarily learn from from our history but okay so coming back to registration so registration registering to be a vendor and getting all your certifications so explain to us what registration is registration is getting all the necessary paperwork and qualifications in so that you can be one of the certifications uh, that will allow you to get fast money. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, so registration, registering to be a vendor, and getting your certification. All right, so an I, which is image. Image is creating a brand that is larger than you are. All of you are small business, but you have to look like you are a Fortune 500 company on paper. You cannot look like a small company, and why is that the reason? Yes, the government is risk averse. Eighty percent of all federal contracting dollar goes to large companies because the government feels that, hey, you know what? Large companies are not risky. So if you are a small business and you look risky, they're not going to want to do business with you. So if you're sending an email from hotdaddyjohn at yahoo.com. Forget it. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not going to discriminate, but if they're choosing between John at ABC Corp or hotdaddyjohn at yahoo.com, they're going to probably go the other direction. So, so, so your image, you know, is they say image is everything. There's some truth to that. And, and sometimes you get a first impression when you're in the government market. Yes. So, some, so, so, we, so image has to do with creating a brand that speaks larger than what you really are. So if you are a small company, don't, IBM started in the garage, right? But what's, what does IBM stand for? international business machine right they didn't call it garage business machine right so sometimes you can't speak about where you are you have to speak about where you want to be and you have to cast an image that they're going to say oh well this company looks solid this company looks strong <laughs> so what does image mean Your eye. <laughs> um, it means the way you present yourself, what, what you want to give off to the people that are looking at you to possibly do business. You yes. You want to make yourself seem smaller than you are. You want to make yourself seem larger. Yes. And it has to do with your name, your business name. It has to do with your marketing collateral. You don't send brochure. You send, mark, you send capability statements. You want to make sure that you have a website that speaks to government buyers. You need to have capability brief. You need to have um, capability videos. Different marketing collateral needs to speak to government buyers. All right, so next is M, which stands for marketing. So marketing is how you engage your buyers or procurement officers or contracting officers. So marketing, we talk about your image, right? Your image is making sure you have a certain, you make sure you look a certain way. Marketing is how you engage your buyers. And you market with your marketing collateral, your capability statements, you market with your capability video. Your business card needs to look a certain way. On your business card, it needs to have your DUNS number, it needs to have your next code on the back of it, because all this is part of your marketing collateral. And so, in terms of marketing, we actually teach you how to, what to say when you're emailing somebody. We teach you what to have on your website. All these things are part of your marketing and, and how you communicate and how you engage your, the buyers. So I think you're up next, right? So summarize to us marketing. Marketing is how you show your company to the buyers themselves. How do you promote yourself? What is the image you're going to give out with your website, with the Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. All right, so up next is relationship. Gerald, that's you. So relationship right. is 
building winning relationships. In the government market, it's not about what you know. It's not about who you know. It's about who knows you back, right? It's a higher standard. Not about what you know. It's not about who you know, but it's about who knows you back. A contracting officer is not going to social you a $3 million contract if they don't know you, if they don't trust you. If they don't believe that you're going to take care of this project and you're going to be successful at it, they're not going to award it back, uh, award you a contract. So relationship has to do with KLT. What does KLT stand for? Anybody knows what that means? Establishing KLT or building KLT. Know you, like you, trust you. Know, like, trust. Great point, Linda. So relationship is about building KLT. Know, like, and trust. So part of your goal in terms of building a relationship is you have to build a relationship to where they know you, first of all. So initial marketing and engaging them is part of knowing, right? Liking means that when, when you're in front of them or when they see your marketing collateral, you're going to stand out. They say, oh, something's unique about this company. And the trusting is that you're going to take care of, of them, that you're going to take care of the project. You're not going to abandon the project. Even if you're, if you're not going to make a lot of money, you're not going to say, well, hey, sorry, I'm not, you know, you're, you're going to trust uh, trust is very important. They're going to they're gonna give you that at the very beginning if you win a contract, but you have to keep that trust and earn it over time so they can get more contracts. So that's relationships. So Gerald, summarize to us relationships. A relationship is a extension of not only your company brand, but also your personal brand and getting to know, know, like, and trust. Get it, letting the specific relationships within the government market to know who you are and you know who they are and also their ability to like you your presentation but also to trust okay great all right so number eight is opportunity so this is you linda so opportunity has to do with finding contracting opportunities or sourcing the right opportunities and here at GCA, we use a bit matching tool because that's the best way to, in terms of aggregating all the project into one place. So all of you as members, you have Gov Directions, right? Gov Directions, you got it down now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> GovDirections.com. As a member, this is your tool. How to source opportunity. Now, now the general tool that everybody uses FBO.gov. FBO. What does FBO stands for? Federal Business Opportunities. So it stands for FBO.gov. So you can go directly to FBO.gov and look for opportunities there. But we use Gov Directions because it aggregates federal contracts, state contracts, local contracts. Over 85,000 agencies is aggregated into Gov Directions, and then you, you just get an email every day. So it saves you time in, 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 uh, in that way. But finding opportunity has to do with three types of opportunities. Past awards, current opportunities, and future projects. Sometimes we call that forecasts. Past, present, and future. You have to know how to find all three. 70% of current opportunities are recompete from past awards. So, for example, if you're in janitorial cleaning services, right? After five years, they're going to put it out back up for bid again. And so a new company is going to come or new company is going to come and bid on the same project. So it's a recompete from five years ago. So, so if you know that this company has a contract for five years and it's year four, then you want to start preparing for it because you can look at historical records, see what they, they were awarded the contract for and start preparing to bid in a year from now. We call it capture management. We don't call it business development in the government market. We don't call it sales. We call it capture management. That's the business development person. Capture management because it's a long capture cycle. And so you have to plan and strategize over a period of time. Society, 
every single department had to order it directly from you. Yeah. Now, How long was that contract? It was only for one year. Okay. So I was going to ask. Now, when you guys are, are just showing us how to get those longer contracts, um, because it's easy to go down and get a one year contract. I just went down to the city hall, I looked at last year's bid, yeah. looked at the numbers, and made sure that I got the contract. Yeah. And made sure that my supplier would be able to supply those prices and sure. still be able to make my profit, which wasn't a big profit margin. But it was then I was dealing with the, the, the money flow, the cash flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as far as these contracts that you guys are, are proposing, they're for long the term, five years? Or yeah, they, they have supply contracts, which are multi years, three years, five years. They have service contracts, which are three year, four year, five years. And so, and so, if you so you want to look for those type of contracts, and they have larger contracts where they they call it uh, they call it uh, IDIQ contracts to where they choose like five companies or four companies. IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. They also have different agencies have different names. You know, like uh, GSA have Oasis, which is where they choose like you know ten companies to do IT services. Uh, and, and so based on those, you compete within those small companies. And so, so, so those are like multi-year, multi, you know, some of them are billions of dollars in terms of aggregate value. And, and only those companies that are awarded as part of that sub group, they can compete on the projects. So there's different ways of how you do it. So opportunities is past, future, pre, uh, past present and future contracts. And, um, and sourcing out contracting opportunities. All right, so Linda, summarize opportunity for us. So opportunity refers to your ability to source contracts that are right for you based on your capabilities. And it involves using tools such as gov directions. Um, it's important to pay attention to past awards so that you know what other vendors have done to be successful so that when that opportunity comes up for a recompete, you can duplicate or imitate some of their success strategies to help you win current and future projects. So we're looking at sourcing opportunities. We're looking at past, present, and future. Awesome. Good, good, good. All right, so instead of coming back to you, I'm going to go to Madalu. So you're going to take proposal. And then Cellini, you're going to take performance. So these are your, your letters and your words. So you're going to be P and you're going to be the second P. So proposal, P is proposal. So proposal has to do with writing proposals. And I know how much you guys just love to write. <laughs> I just finished uh, my first novel and uh, it's been 10 years. <laughs> 10 years to finish. and. And I had to get help from my wife, my friends, you know, everybody else. But this story was given to me in a vision. And so it's finally finished and I'm excited about it. But writing, I like to write creatively. I don't like to write structure in terms of proposal style, right? But I have to learn how to write in a structured format because that's how the government wants it. So the, in terms of proposal writing, what you have to keep in mind is the government's going to say in the solicitation or the RFP request for proposal, they're going to say, we want you to give us A, B, and C. In your proposal, you will say, I will give you A, B, and C, and this is how I'm going to give it to you. This is why you should, get, you, you should award it to me, and this is the reason why we're doing it this way. So you just give it how and why in addition to A, B, C. Don't just tell them, they say we want A, B, C. Don't tell them we're going to give you A, B, C. That's not a responsive. They're not going to consider that responsive. If they say we want A, B, and C, you don't say we're going to give you A, B, C, and D. Don't do that also. Only give them what they ask for. Now, if, you're, if they're asking and you, for example, if they're, if they're asking for a carpet, or let's use paint. If they're asking for paint and that paint has lead on there 
and you know that you cannot use lead in paint anymore, but the government is asking for that, and the contract officer didn't know any better, right? And they're asking for some type of paint that is not safe. Well, you, in that situation, you're going to tell them, we're going to uh, give you A, B, and C, but we suggest that you take D instead of C. And you can make recommendations like that. Uh, but generally, if they ask for ABC, you give them ABC. And then you tell them why you're going to do it and how you're going to do it and all the reasons why they should choose you. Like you have, you've been around for 20 years, you have quality assurance program in place, and you have a safety program in place, and you have a seasoned team, and you have, you're financially strong. Give them every reason that you can of why they should choose you. And that's your proposal. So that's a shortcut in terms of what proposal writing is. Huh? Question, Chile? Um, the you just said, um, that uh, Dr. Ed and they would to the public volunteer rescue and the idea that to do to the community. I did, um, I had to discuss uh, some sidewalks that were first set up towards the county. Mm -hmm. And they said the money was a little bit more than the lower bid, but at least when they chose me, because my bid, I put down, which I had, that I was running the tree stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> because we had to add a stops and had count rails. Yeah. And it was obvious there was a tree stop there. So, in my, so I did add that, you know, I did everything else, but I did add the fact that I would grind up and remove mm -hmm. the tree stops. Yeah. And, and, and if you're doing, that's called value add. Where they didn't ask for it and you're going to do it regardless. That's, that's just good business, right? And you're going above and beyond the call of duty. And in your pricing, you're not going to say, hey, we're going to charge you double the amount. You, you're, gonna, you're going to squeeze it and, and price it to where it's still competitive, and they're going to love that a little bit better, yes. So in something like that, you, know, you, you, you can do value add. Uh, in some industries, I don't recommend value add, but in some industry, you can do value add like that, because that's just, that's just going to make it easier because the tree stump, instead of deteriorating over 20 years and, and termites eating it, you actually eliminate some potential hazards for them. So that, that's good. All right, so Madalu, summarize proposal for us. <laughs> well, the first thing of the proposal is the big challenge mm -hmm. working with the government. government because it's writing and uh, justifying why you should be Yeah. And the first thing is you need to answer every one of the requests that they are. Mm -hmm. and each of them should be uh, presented in the how yep. they resolve, why is that resolved, mm -hmm. and the reason that this is done in this way. Yeah. They are a big recommendation that only offer what they request, unless uh, there is a good recommendation mm -hmm. that will avoid a problem uh, later. Or a value, like you were saying, yeah. that would be a better service, or you know that is very quickly a new politics or new thing. Um, why you need to do that? You need to also present which is the company, the history, the experience, the capability, mm -hmm. the, the capability plan. Yeah. Um, and with that, they need to find very a structural, really. <clears throat> Why may you better than your providers? Yep. Okay, good. Good summary. Awesome. All right, Chalini, you are the next P. You're step number 10, which is performance. So performance is where you've gone through nine steps. All of that is to get to the point where you, you win a contract. Now you have to perform on it, meaning you, performance is delivering on the work, on the service, or the product. And when you're performing, you, you have to keep in mind that you're going to have to engage the, the program manager or the supervisor. You're going to have to engage the contracting, the buyer also. You're going to have to engage the customer, which is the people that you're going to, you're going to engage, the, all the people that you're going to be working around. So you're going to be interacting with different people, and you have to treat all of them as your customers. And you have to treat all of them, engage all of them. The, if you're doing, for example, you're doing janitorial cleaning in this building here, and this is a government facility, and we're all using it, and somebody's coming to clean, they have to treat us as if we're, you know, we're the customer. They also have to treat the, 
the, uh, the contracting officer with respect. They have to treat the contracting officer technical representative with respect. And, and, but there's only one person that you engage in terms of communication and that you ultimately have authority back to is the contracting officer. The, the person who's on site, the core, the COR, the contracting officer's representative, these are all the people that you engage. You may have to talk to the people that's working there and say, and, and coordinate with them to make sure that no one's at the facility while you're doing work. You have to do many different things, but the ultimate authority goes back to the contracting officer. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. If, if, if you're working on a facility and someone says, hey, um, while you're performing this, can you change up that door? What's your answer? Your answer is always yes, I can do it, but can you have the contracting officer provide that to me in writing? And then, now if you say yes and you do it, you're not going to get them paid because the contracting officer didn't authorize it. So always keep that in mind. The answer is always yes. Whatever change they want, yes, I would do it. Be more than happy to do it, but make sure they do it in writing. And in a perfect world, it's a change of order. That's the perfect world. Or at least an email confirmation. If it's something minor, not, not substantial, like $1,000, $2,000, something minor, email confirmation is fine. But if something $20,000, $50,000 that can really hurt your pocket, make sure it's done through a real change order so that you can get paid. So that's performance. All right, summarize performance for us. Well, make sure that whatever you're supposed to do, Try your best to do it on time. Promise? Absolutely, yes. Make sure that your staff and your employees are professional. Yep. Make sure everybody has a chain of command. Mm -hmm. Because like um, he just said, you know, they might just walk up to one of your employees. <laughs> they might give them an answer. So your employees need to know who they need to give, uh, who's the person, who's the project manager or the supervisor for your team on that project. Exactly. You don't Great know, point. I want to look unprofessional and confused. Mm -hmm. So I'll take this one person. Good. So, so on your side, you have a chain of, of command. On their side, there's a chain of command. So on, on your side, you usually have a supervisor on site. On their side, it all, always go back to any change of, of, of work has to go back to the contract officer. All right, so that's number 11. So we'll come back over here. So number 11, we cha we're changing it up a little bit. So number 11 is compliance. Compliance just means that you're going to do the work and you're gonna, uh, you're gonna report, the re uh, fill out the reports that they ask. You're gonna make sure that you understand the regulations. If they're asking for insurance, you're gonna supply your insurance letter. If they're asking for bonding, you're gonna provide the bonding uh, letter. If they're asking for a line of credit, uh, a letter from the bank, you're gonna provide that compliance. It's just making sure that you do all the paperwork and you understand, you understand the regulation of what they're asking for and you are doing it to meet that standard or or supersede that standard. So that's compliance. Now, the main, under, under the federal government market, the main regulation you have to know is what? FAR. FAR, the FAR. What does FAR stands for? Federal Acquisition Regulations. Yes, that is the, that is the contracting bible. Every single federal agency goes by the FAR, and then some agency have what they call supplemental, uh, supplemental regulations. So, for example, the DOD have DFARS, Defense Federal Acquisition Supplemental. NASA have their own supplemental regulations. FEMA have their own regulations, supplemental regulations, because the way in their industry, like at the most agency. They try to go by what's competitive or what's low, you know, what's low price, right? Do you think NASA wants the lowest price? No. They don't want a spacecraft to go up halfway to the moon and blow up. <laughs> You've already had that, right? <laughs> That's already happened. So they, they want the highest quality, the latest technology, the best that humanity can create. Whereas janitorial, do you think they care whether you are using 
the latest germ zapping UV light robot machines, or are you just using a cloth to wipe down things? I mean, if it's a hospital, they might care, but for a regular office, they really don't care. So compliance, summarize compliance for us. Yes. And what does FAR stands for? Federal Acquisition Regulation. Awesome. All right. All right. So finally, number 12, which is C, which is closure. Closure, or sometimes we call it closeout. Closure is making sure that you get all your documentation signed and that you get your invoice release, you submit it to the, the, the online system. Usually it's an online invoicing system. Almost most agencies use an online invoicing system. Make sure that you submit your invoice to the online system and make sure you get paid. So that's your end. The closure on the contracting officer's perspective is very complex. They have a stack of paper this thick that they have to go through. They have to work with multiple people. They have to work with the supervisor. They have to work with the contract officer represented. They have to work with the termination contract officer. They have to work with the client. And usually they have to work with many different people to pull all of that in addition to working with you as a company, as a business. They have to work with lots of different people to close out their part of it. And so from that, you want to make sure that during this process, you make it easy for the contracting officer. Make their work a joy. Don't be a burden to them. Or else they're going to get frustrated with you and they're not going to like you the next time you're looking for another project with them. So make their job an easy, a, a easy one. How is the government language to say black week? It's called EPLS. EPLS. Excluded Party Listing System. You don't want to be on EPLS. Thank you. So if you are a contractor that abandons the project, if you are a contractor that that does not complete work satisfactory and you don't resolve the issues and you just say I did the work and the contract officer is not happy and you just kind of like well I, I did based on my interpretation of the scope of work and if you're not happy that's your fault. If they're not satisfied they can put you on EPLS and when you're when you get on EPLS they put your name, they put your social, they put your company name and they put your company EIN number on there. And so you're pretty much blacklisted, debarred until you resolve the issues. The closure is serious. You'll make sure that they're happy. If they're happy, you, you're happy. Like in my family, a happy wife is a happy life, right? <laughs> so in the market, a happy contracting officer is a happy business owner. All right, so closure, summarize that for us. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> now, the closure for us is just basically um, uh, evaluating this project with you, making sure all your documents are completed, you know how, uh, so that it's submitted, so that it's legal. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the closure officer uh, reached out to my own company and um, other, other people that you want to tie up. So you need to make your part of the job easy for the company. Exactly. So you get awesome. Yep. All right. So we've gone through our 12 steps, and that took uh, all the time here we got. So, so you guys have a better understanding of the 12 steps now? Great job. Right, so, so who knows, without looking, who knows all 12 steps, the acronyms, and the words? Uh, no, no, nobody wants Bitcoin? work on it.
Go work on it, and next week, if you come back and you know it, I might give away some Bitcoin still. Wow. Okay? So go work on it. Memorize the 12 steps. Get to know the acronyms, at least the letters. And then if once you understand the, the acronym Rob CC, then you understand each each letter, what they mean, the words itself. And then once you understand the words, then you can start to understand what they mean. And the more familiar you are with these 12 steps, the more success you're gonna have. This is part of learning governance. Acronym Rob CC. Thank you very much. All right, so this is awesome. I will see you guys next Tuesday, same time for deep dive training session. The following Tuesday, we're going to have a holiday party, and we're going to ask FEMA, one of our friends for FEMA, she's going to come and speak a little bit in terms of how to do business with FEMA and talking about FEMA contracting opportunities for 2018. And uh, so that's, that's what we're going to do. She's going to spend probably about you know 20 minutes to talk about that. Besides that, we're going to play some games and have some fun. And who's coming? Anybody coming? OK. It's I'll be there. Awesome. So if you are coming, bring a side with you. Any, you know, show us your your uh, your skills, your chef skills. And if you, uh, I'm in the mood for some Mexican food. I'm in the mood for some soul food. Yeah. So if you got any skills, you know, bring bring your skills, and and uh, come, and we're gonna have fun on the 12th. So that's that's not next week, but the following week. And then that would be our last session before next January. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next week. Thanks, Abraham. Great job. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>